the full human being, and I'll get to this when I talk about later about the upper school, the full human being is to explain the human being. It doesn't help to explain the general human being. You have to understand the biography of a particular person. And every biography of a human being starts here and begins to tell this whole story. We're talking about this taming of the soul force. So for the seven to nine year old or the, the child when they come to school and just before they go into the Rubicon, they actually they live in the souls of the people around them. They're still part of the family, the teacher, their friends. They're, they still feel like they're part of the world. They don't feel yet isolated. So they're living in all these soul forces very much determined by what's happening around them. But now at the Rubicon, they begin to, those soul forces from outside begin to leave the outside and come into the child. They internalize, just like we've been watching the internalization of outside forces into the being. And this can be a very difficult time because the parents, unless they've learned this, they've learned how the children go through this, they can be very shocked because they felt very close to their child and all of a sudden they also feel a distance, an emptiness. The child is no longer in them. And we are so busy today. Many, many adults maybe, or they're too busy, the man and the woman are both busy in their jobs. They don't, they, they're not careful enough of the care that a child might need at this age. I remember very distinctly when I went through this period. Because my parents would say, we're, next weekend we will go to the countryside and have a picnic. So I've been in picnics in the past, I've been in the country, so I'm excited about this. And I start to make pictures, because this, I'm making pictures, but my imagination is growing, and I'm imagining what will happen on the basis of what happened in the past. I imagine in detail what we will do. I'm looking forward to this, and I imagine in detail what we will do on the picnic. And then the day would come, and maybe it would be raining, and there'd be a problem with the car, and I began to think, I can't trust the pictures I make. Anything could happen in the future. And then I began to realize we could even die. It could be fearful what could happen in the future, or have an accident in a car. Of course, before that I knew about accidents, but I never related it to me, because my life, those things didn't happen. And now, I started to be totally unsure of the future, and it was a real crisis. I really felt, for the first time, I didn't know what was going on. It was a real shock for me, and I even told my mother, Mother, I don't know what's going to happen in the future. And she would look, yeah, well, that's the way it is. She didn't realize what a crisis it was for me. And it was so bad that I thought, I don't know what's going to happen. Anything could happen. I've got to do something about this. No one will help me. So I came up with a solution. Just like when I was a little child, I used to have nightmares. When I would go to sleep, I would, these monsters would chase me. And then I realized I could wake up. And then I got really excited to meet them. And then just before they ate me, I would wake up and they couldn't get me. And I wanted to have a nightmare so that I could wake up and beat the monster. But then they went away. I had no more nightmares. So I had to find a solution. So then I figured out, I said, if nothing ever happens the way I think of it, then I only have to think of the worst things happening and they can't possibly happen. And I would do that. If we were going to do something I liked, I would sit in the car and I would think the worst thing that could happen, we're going to have an accident any minute and then this is going to happen, it's going to rain, it's going to be closed, and nothing, none of those things ever happen. And my mother, no, I used to draw beautiful pictures, and, you know, of trees and, uh, and um, buildings and children walking. And then I started to draw these, these monster pictures. A monster. Yeah. yeah. I started to draw these horrible pictures, and my mother couldn't figure out, why am I doing that? And because I'm really beginning to go through a kind of morose... Uh, Phase. So Rudolf Steiner speaks about how important this time is for the child. And that the child is, gets more and more because now his wishing, his desires, his anxieties, 
they're all beginning to be very personal and they need they need the teacher and they need the parents to bring them stories and to bring them um, food of light force, soul, soul light, soul force, and soul light. They need the beautiful pictures of the world. Now this is interest, this is activities that are outside you, that are working, that are like building houses, like gardening, and this is then the force the teacher needs to bring, that life is full of joy and full of promise. What's most important is the parents don't, they watch for the, they really watch what's happening with the child. They don't wish it wouldn't happen because they want something different. They really watch and they try to bring the child also with the teacher what the child needs as they're going through this phase. Now, Maggie made a, an interesting statement because I put thinking, feeling, willing here. Because Steiner's whole theory of soul development says the cognition is the is the basis for cognition is the nerve sense system, for feeling is the rhythmic system, and for will the metabolic system. So I've changed this, that might be more helpful to you. So now the child is moving. Remember this is the soul forces. So now the soul forces are manifesting in the physical body, in the metabolic system, in the limb system, and now you have puberty. The beginning of puberty. And you remember I talked about this growth rate curve. Yeah? So just after this period of what we call the Rubicon phase, now the growth very rapidly. So, so this is rate, so it's not amount of growth, it's the rate of growth. So the, the growth rate in some children, for instance, you told me at around this time you grew to your full height. Yeah? Who was it? Ah, it was May, excuse me. Okay, May, you know May is quite tall. And she grew the whole time. Uh, no, no, she stopped that she had that already at 12 years old. That's unusual. Yeah, but it's more with girls than with boys. This rate will go much higher and then down. Yeah. And what's happening here, whereas before the growth forces were more and more coming from the head, in other words, the forming was from the head downwards. Yeah. The forming from the head downwards. You're growing, but the forming is the more, the more releasing, the freeing of the process is going from the head down. When they're young. Up, up until this time here. Yeah. Until nine. Until nine. And then at puberty, the forces are coming from the periphery, the metabolic forces. So the growth actually starts in the hands and the feet, and, and rather than come from the head, it's coming from the periphery. And you can see the difference here between five and seven when the metabolic forces were being formed and freed and uh, matured by the, um, uh, by the head forces, then the child was quite um, coordinated here. Quite coordinated and quite light and free. But now, when the metabolic forces are so strong and the growth is so much, the child is losing its coordination that it had before. It becomes more and more uncoordinated and um, clumsy. And now, in a way, for the younger child, for the 9, 10, even 11 year old child, this whole soul world wasn't really divided so much into male and female. But now with puberty, now the soul, you might say, really attacks the body and the child becomes male or female. I say attack because the soul forces are really invading the life forces. The child is growing, the child begins to have acne and problems with, um, uh, what do you call it, Your allerg allergies, there's a whole problem of a destabilization in the met 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 metabolism. And their generating forces, which have just been generating their own body, now become the sexual generation forces, you know, sexual reproduction. So all of these things are going on in the child's body. The soul forces are being attacked, attached more and more to the bodily forces. 
And the child can start to get very difficult because they feel they have very powerful forces. These are very strong energy forces. And they feel like they could be an adult now. They're becoming sexually mature. They feel like they can be an adult, but just on a soul level. Because this is actually the time when all the animals stop their, uh, child, their young phase, and all animals then immediately enter into being older animals as soon as they reach sexual reproduction. Now, animals don't have this period called adolescence. If you've ever worked on a farm where they have sheep, perhaps, you're, you're amazed by the little, um, what are they called, the tiny sheep? Lambs, little lambs. They just jump around and they play all the time and they look so cute. Yeah? Yeah? And then, to watch, all of a sudden they reach sexual maturity and then they become sheep. Yeah? And that happens to all animals, from a youth to old age, they just, through sexual maturity, in a way that their, their life has finished in that sense. Human beings have this adolescence phase. So the child feels like an adult, or should be an adult, but they're not at all yet an adult. They're still just an animal. They're still just an animal. <laughs> they're animal-like. They're still ruled by their souls, not yet by their ego. There's a, a Waldorf teacher who gave a wonderful picture of this uh, adolescence. So you can imagine this whole phase is in the water, and the water recedes. And here now you have the wind, the air, the storms. So he makes this picture that you've got to understand. When you get to this phase, what should I use here? Yeah? You have the wind blowing. All kinds of weather. It can be beautiful weather and then it's bad, but you begin to have all these moods of the like the weather. Beautiful day and a stormy day and a dark day and a bright day. So he has this picture. The parents and the teacher need to be like a lighthouse to the to the uh, to the adolescent. You know, you always put a lighthouse where there's a danger, potential danger. Yeah? And so but the lighthouse doesn't move. The lighthouse stays solid, and you can trust the lighthouse will tell you what to do. I don't know how it is in China, but in the West, these young people, they want to go places they're not supposed to go, and they want to stay out late. They want to drink, they want to smoke, they want to go do what adults do. They feel, I should be able to be an adult. And this can be a very, very difficult time for the parents if they don't understand how to act in this period. They shouldn't follow them around and t tell them what they should do all the time, but they should have very clear rules and they shouldn't give in. And they shouldn't argue them. They should say, this is the way it is. This is the way it is. Come home at this time. No, come home at this time. They will argue, argue. No, come home at this time. And they must, because the child actually wants to trust the adult. They want some. They want that, but they'll act like they don't want that. Yeah? So they want, they want an eye that's sure, because they don't have an eye that's sure yet. And so they need eyes, not astral bodies around them, trying to convince them to be good all the time. Okay. So now we pass from 14 to 21. Now these forces yeah, are really coming here, and these forces are really coming here. That means more and more from 14 to 21, the thinking will go into the will, and the will will go into the thinking. Here's where Rudolf Steiner speaks about the forces or the, the reality of the spiritual world. We have the processes, the life processes in the life world, the soul forces, really in a soul world. And here the child 
is really entering the world. And the world, according to spiritual science, is formed by spiritual beings that are archetypes. Okay. The soul world has soul forces. Okay. But the spiritual world, you have the hierarchy of beings I've spoken to about angels, archangels, archons. Okay. All right, and these are beings who manifest in the world, and we know them in our thinking as archetypes, as thoughts. Yeah. Now, why am I telling you this? About when I'm talking about 14 to 21, we're not going to tell the young people this, but they need these archetypes. They need to meet these archetypes, even if in a lower consciousness, not a spiritual consciousness, but they need to meet the archetypes. Here, we're dealing with stories. Here, we're dealing with imagination. We want to train the child's imagination to be able to control their imagination and imagine very, very detailed things. Music, for instance, and, and history. We want them to imagine these things. Here, we're going to take them into the realm of the archetypes. They're going to feel it's no longer my story. This is the real world around me. Here we really bring them into science, history, and industry. They really learn here about inventions. They, they really learn about how the world is working outside. Yeah? Government. Of course, we've been slowly introducing these archetypes all the way along. We, because these archetypes are alive. They're full of soul. And we've slowly been here introducing the animal world, introducing the plants and the man. But we haven't pushed to the dry logical science. And now we should get really serious about how the world works outside with children. In the, uh, maybe I mentioned this, but in France, in the Waldorf School where we live, they're now bringing in an electronics section for 9, 10, and 11 year old boys and girls. They need to learn how the phones work that they so much want to use. They need to learn in detail science. They need not be behind because they're in a older school, but actually ahead of the other children. It's last nine, ten, and eleven each. No, yeah, sorry. Class nine, ten, and eleven. Oh, that's so in the upper school. Here, in these early years, it will be more theoretical. Here, the child is beginning to understand this in relation to destiny. There'll be interest in different people. The children are going to very much separate here and go in different directions, be interested in different parts of the world. Here are the parents, here are the teacher. But here, other people, not the parents, not the teacher, other people, their friends, or people in the industry, or people in arts, they'll be interested in individual people. Human relationship is very important for them, now from 16 to 18. These forces begin to penetrate each other. Their thinking comes into their will. They're going to have to know how to go out in the world and take a hold of a particular part of the world and make become masters in it. Uh, their self is going to now, more and more, they're going to take a particular direction into which will eventually also be a relation to the spiritual world, even to the point that they could become great in one thing or another. But they will turn this into their own personal path. Because if this has been a healthy process, but also going healthily through all the crises, through all the phases, then the child here begins to be healthy enough that the whole of the spiritual world, the picture I'm trying to give you, is the whole of the world is coming into the person, into the person. The world becomes the person. You are a representation of whole, the whole world. Now, this has all been preparation for now the human being goes out into the world and changes the world one way or another. We all do. I just want to add one more thing. In the upper school, because you're building an upper school here now, it's very important as the, in the 11th, 12th class that the children do projects. They bring this themselves and they also get involved in the local community, in industry or organizations. They see, they do placements, they see how the world is working. They begin to see 
how they could apply themselves to the world. And we never teach anthroposophy in all of these grades. But now it's the 12th class. Now the 12th class in the, is in the summer after they've, had, they've graduated. There is a camp or a workshop where we do introduce what's been behind Waldorf education. We begin to talk about anthroposophy. They're leaving them, huh? If they want to. If they want to, leaving them very free. But many of the students now, they want, they've heard there's something funny going on behind this, this thinking of our teachers. They want to know about it. Remember here, the child first starts to be nurtured with the mother's milk. And the and anthroposophy sees that everything the child is given is a form of nutrition, a form of helping that child grow until they become an adult. I'm only using age as a marker, but all the time, especially because it's getting earlier and earlier, and children are more and more different. So you really have to develop your capacity to perceive what's going on in the child. And with modern culture, it's, it's coming sooner and sooner. Children are being pushed into puberty sooner and sooner. Okay? 14 and 21, is there another crisis? Yeah. Yeah. Well, like you said, yeah. Yeah. I know, you can, you can look at this like birth, okay? At, at birth, a physical body is born. It can be a very traumatic experience. It can take many hours and be very painful for the mother and dangerous for the child. Or the child can come very quickly and there can be no problem at all. And this really is the birth of the life body. So this around three, three, four, this, this defiance yeah, is the eye shining for the first time into the life body and the child has an experience in the life body of eye. Has an experience in their life as eye. You see where you point to Sorry. This here is three years old. And a lot depends on how the mother and the father handle the child at this age. If you just yell no at your child all the time, you'll get the same thing back even stronger. Because something's being born. And here, the soul is really being born. And it really can be very painful, now for the parents and for the child. And it makes all the difference if the parents and the teachers know what the child is going through, understand what the child is facing in their own consciousness. And here, the ego is really being born. And this can be very, very difficult time for many parents. I don't know about China, but this, this is a very big event in the soul, but this can get very physical. The children, the young Americans, they want to go out and get cars, they steal cars. My, my uh, brother's kids, they broke into a, a supermarket and took things, yeah? It can be, get very dangerous. It, it depends on the generation, too. My father was very hard on me, and I was a very difficult kid, you know. I didn't take that. And so we were at battle all the time. But I was part of a generation that was fighting an older generation. Whereas we had four boys who never had any really big problems to do. Because we were, all, we, we were careful to bring them through this process. We even had these op opposite problems. No, 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 because my daughter, it was even the opposite problem, because my daughter said, I'm not happy because I'm just too healthy and too normal. <laughs> she, she was just too, too happy and she wished she had some problem. Not, not problems, she wanted more challenge. She felt the, the high school didn't challenge her enough in the world of high school. It's a big problem in the world of high school. Because it's so dominated by the middle school, the Waldorf school. The high school is still trying to find its place in the Waldorf high school in the West. Now I have met a young man from uh, the high school in Paris, and he said, it was fantastic. They took me up to the Renaissance, and then they dropped me. I didn't know, they didn't really teach me anything about what's going on now, the modern world, technology. Now, this is a real, real challenge today in the modern world. The upper school. Here, the young person starting puberty thinks they're an adult, they can go do adult things. 
here, too soon, the young person thinks that they know how to, the world should run. They haven't had any real experience working in the world yet. So you don't want to give them an impression that they know everything here. You want them to, their challenge is to be, take them further into the world, you know? And have faith in the, bio, in the child. Don't think that they have to do this, have to do that. One of our sons, he was just not doing well. He was just having too good a time and he was having difficulty with his teachers and he just wasn't learning. We, were, we weren't having difficulty with him, but he wasn't doing anything. He wasn't really applying himself. So finally I said to him, Sean, this isn't working. You're not applying yourself in this school. What are we going to do? And first he said, well, I don't know how to make anything. I don't really know how anything works. Of course he had plenty of art and drawing and painting and music, but he wanted to get into matter. So I called a friend of mine who was a mechanic and asked him, could he help? And he, he knew a master builder who knew how to, to build big buildings and, and work with concrete and work with metal in Norway. And so we sent him to Norway when he was about 15 to, to work. And he learned a lot, but then he came back and he said, I don't think I want to do that. <laughs> and then the Len had heard of a clown school in Switzerland, where a very famous clown had a school to teach people to juggle, to acrobats, to do mime. And we sent him there three years. Uh, yeah, it was a full school, but a physical theater. Yeah, they learned. So, and he completely changed. He became very, very mature, and then he knew what he wanted. He wanted to be an artist, he wanted to create. No, he's now, he has his own film company. He's, he's not the actor. He's now a producer and director. Now, I only, we could tell you many stories about all the children. I'm going to finish now. I'm only telling you that because the most important thing is to trust your children, trust their destiny, especially if you've given them so much. Then stand behind them and work with them and find out. And they might have to do, try many things together. Okay, thank you.